So we'll start with 2 Corinthians 5.17, and then we're going to flip over to Proverbs chapter 3 once we talk about Corinthians here. So in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul is writing to the ch church at Corinth. And he is explaining his ministry. He is praying for the saints. He's talking about his apostleship. He is writing to the church and he is giving them instruction based on the specific needs that they have. And as he's writing to the church, he is talking about what it means to be in the presence of Christ in the future. What it's going to mean to be with Christ and his motivation for loving Christ and the future reward that there is to hold. And he's talking about what it is to be in Christ. To have repented of your sins. To have acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To have acknowledged Christ as the master of your life. To say that it's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in me. That you have wholly, totally, and completely turned your life over to God. That you're done living for yourself. That you are ready to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about what that means. Because it's easy to say a few words. You know, it's easy to say, I'm giving my life to Jesus, so Jesus forgive me. You know, that's the thing about professing to be a Christian. That's the thing about Christianity, is that in reality, what I am telling you is incredibly simple. When I come and I share the gospel, the message of the gospel is incredibly simple. It's so simple that even Jesus says a child can understand it. And he says, keep, allow the little children, don't keep them from me. It's amazing how simple the message of the good news is. Profess your faith receive the good news, and live your life for Jesus. Surrender everything to him, obey him alone, and serve God. You know, when Jesus is asked what's the most important law there is, he quotes the Shema. And he says that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And then he adds on, a second commandment and says that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes even further when he's talking to his disciples in the book of John. And he says that you shall love one another as I have loved you. With a love that's so great, so sacrificial that you are willing not only to love your brother, but that you are willing to die for your brother as Jesus died for you. And so the good news of the gospel is amazingly simple. Repent, believe, receive. I mean, you could nutshell it into three words. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever shall believe it in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Simple. But the difference between doing <clears throat> and hearing is night and day. Question? John 3, 16. Believe, receive. You're good. I didn't want you to be like looking confused the whole thing, so it's fair. I'll clear that up now. You know, I could get with you. So, look, the thing about it is that, you know, when I talk about it, and I talk about the gospel, and I talk about this message of Jesus, it is amazing how simple it is. It's not hard. It's not complicated. It's simple. Believe in Jesus. But yet... So many of us, even those that want to believe, 
struggle. Because even though it's an incredibly simple message, it's incredibly hard to actually do it. To actually surrender your life and give up control. To actually be willing to say, you know what? I don't have this. To be willing to surrender your life to God. To be willing to be obedient to the word of the Lord. To live not for yourself, but for Jesus Christ. Easy to say, but hard to do. It's just like when people come up to you, if they've ever given you advice on addiction. I'm sure plenty of people have told you just to stop. Well, just stop. Just stop doing it. Put it down. Stop drinking. Stop getting high. Yeah, simple. Just stop. Sure. Why didn't I think of that? Right? I, I, can't, I can't believe I'm so glad that you came to me and told me to stop because I had not considered that that was a possibility. Right? That's what you're thinking when they tell you that. You know, I'm so glad that you came up to me and told me that today because, you know, in all these years of struggling, it never occurred to me that I could actually just stop. And I want to thank you for delivering that message to me. Because now I know that I can stop. I'm going to go ahead right now and I'm going to stop. Right? Oh, you've all heard it before from somebody. Just stop. Yeah, no kidding. Right? But that doesn't help you. That doesn't help you. You know you can stop. You know you can stop. Of course you know you can stop. <laughs> You knew you could stop the minute you started. That doesn't explain the why that you're doing it. It doesn't explain the hole that's inside of you, that compulsion that's leading you to do it. Those moments of distress where you break down and you decide to do something that even though in you, you know you shouldn't. Even though deep down inside you know it's bad, yet somehow there's still that compulsion that you just can't quite get around that brings you back to that spot. That spot where you make a bad decision because you wanna feel temporarily better. You want that temporary relief. You want that temporary experience. You want that moment where you can slip away and forget about whatever it is that's the problem. The relapse moment. That moment where you choose to do that which you know you shouldn't do, but yet you do it anyway. For a whole bunch of different reasons. The reasons can be varied, but at the end it's because there's a hole inside, there's a lacking, there's a need, and you feel like that's the only way you can meet that need. And so you go for it. And you make a slip up. And you get right back to where you were. Sometimes you get lucky and it's just a little slip up and you get back with it right away. Sometimes you go deep into a rabbit hole, a deep well, long time. They're not all the same. It depends on the circumstances, the level of hopelessness, the level of despair. The problem that you're facing that seems too overwhelming. And so there you are. Confronted with a very simple reality. Just stop. Okay. But still battling with the why. Still fighting with the enemy that is convincing you that somehow it is better to destroy yourself than to live. That has sold you a lie so profound and so powerful that you are willing to do that which you know is destructive rather than to choose life. Because that's how good a liar the devil is. Because the devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. He has been a liar since the beginning and he has been getting mankind, humankind to make decisions that result in death since the very first temptation in the garden. Make no mistake, every single temptation that the devil has presented with humanity since the beginning, since the moment that he whispered to Eve and said, did God really say, has been about death, 
has been about destruction. He is at war with humanity, and his goal is to see that you die, that you die separated from God, that you die in your sin, that you die in a state that is fallen so that you will reap the same eternal destruction that he is bound for. He is going to hell. He knows he's going to hell, and his desire is to bring as many of us with him as possible. Not because he is going to be the warden of hell. No, in fact, he is going to be the worst offender. He is going to be like one of the Al-Qaeda bombers that's at that Colorado Supermax. There's one guy that's never left his cell. I can't remember his name. Abu, I don't even, I'm not even going to try. I saw a 60 Minutes special on him. Abu Saif, I think. Anyway. I don't know. That's probably wrong. But there's one of them, and he's such a diehard believer that for him to have, as he would view it, an infidel touch him would be unacceptable, and he has to be patted down and leave his cell, so he has refused. And he has been stuck inside that cell, that little tiny cell where he showers in there, his meals are served to him in there. He has never left that cell for over the decade that he has been locked up never having human contact the worst offender in the place that's the devil's ultimate fate he is going to be thrown into the very bottom of the pit of the fiery furnaces of hell the lake of fire he is going to be the worst offender make no mistake jesus christ is lord of heaven and he is lord of hell god is lord of everything and satan is the worst offender that hell is going to have but like a truly destructive and evil person that he is, he is desirous to bring as many of us with him as possible. And so he convinces you. He whispers to you. He lies to you. He sells you on destroying yourself. Because that's what a good salesman he is. But the solution that Jesus brings us is simple, praise God. Repent. Admit that you're broken. Believe that God actually loves you. Don't believe the lie of the devil. Believe that God actually loves you. He loves you so much that he was willing to die for you. That you were created with a purpose, that you have purpose, that you are special, that you are holy, that you are sanctified through the power of God. Believe in God. And then surrender to him, receive him. And he can change your life. He can fill the hole. The devil can't fill it. I think by now you've learned that drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever it is that you're struggling with, pornography, whatever, whatever addiction that is or combination of addictions, because for some of us it's not one, right? It might be two or three or four. You might just have the whole buffet. I don't know. You might just be trying everything to fill that hole. One's not enough, so you go for a second. Two's not enough, so you go for three. Three's not enough, so you go for four. And yet somehow you try all of these things, and the hole is still there. Feels better for a minute, but yet then it opens right back up, up and down, up and down. But Jesus says that if you'll actually receive him, if you'll believe that he can fill that hole. Simple. So simple. Simple. But yet choosing, it's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because I can't choose for you. Nobody can choose for you. You have to choose for yourself. And no matter how close you think you are to Jesus, no matter how holy your roommates are, no matter how much your friends are devoted to God, no matter how much your grandparents may pray for you, Ultimately, nobody can make the decision. Nobody can bridge the gap except for you. It's amazing to me. I, I was rereading the story of Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion today. And I was reading about Judas. And it's amazing to me that Judas could walk with Jesus through his entire ministry. Could see more miracles than could be recorded in all of the books of the Bible together. Talks about there being so many miracles that there'd be no space in books to fill them all. 
that he could literally see hundreds of blind men see, countless paralytics walk, that he could see lepers be healed, that he could watch miracle after miracle, that he could see the heavens part, a dove descend and land on Jesus after a baptism in the Jordan River, that he could witness all of these miracles, and yet he could go and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. That he could come up to Jesus after betraying him and kiss him. Literally kissing the doorway to eternal life. And still not enter through. Make no mistake, it's not about how close your friends are. Their righteousness won't rub off on you. Not if you don't want it to. Judas was walking around with the living God. Witnessed it day in and day out, slept by his side. Was in charge of the money for the ministry. He was God's chief accountant on earth. The CFO of Jesus, if you will. And yet for 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed Jesus. Easy, but so hard. But yet, if you choose, there is hope. Because whatever it is you're struggling with, only through Jesus, only through dedicating your life to God, can you fill that hole. It takes work. It's going to be the hardest work that you ever do. Because the hardest work that you ever do will yield the best results. The things that you work the hardest for are the things that you appreciate the most, the things that you cherish the most. I have presents in my house that I got as, little, as a little kid, a few things left. They're things I really didn't cherish as a kid because they were presents. I didn't work for them. I have a pair of boxing gloves that my mom got me when I was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. She hated Christmas shopping. She hated it. And so every year... We would get the Hamacher Schlemmer catalog in the mail, which was kind of like the sharper image, but better. Because they would always like look up rare and unique things, and then they would have this catalog full of them. And I remember one year as a kid, she would have me flip through it and say, pick something out. You know, and I knew as long as it was within a reasonable amount of money, I would get it. And so I was flipping through, and one year there were these boxing gloves. It was a limited edition of, I don't know, 1,000 or 1,500, whatever it was. And they were signed by Muhammad Ali. And he was alive at the time. I was probably 7 to 10 years old. So this is going to be the late 80s, early 90s. He wasn't, you know, as much of a legend by then. Will Smith hadn't done a movie about him yet. You know, there hadn't been. He, he was still alive. So it was a valuable thing, but it wasn't ridiculous. And so I was like, I want the boxing gloves. Those look cool. So she's like, okay. And I got those boxing gloves. And I remember I used to put them on and go around the house and just, you know, I'd be boxing the couch or boxing, you know, they were signed by Muhammad Ali, but I didn't care. They were just boxing gloves. They looked cool. And I didn't realize that, like, you're supposed to put them in a glass case, that they're special. Because I didn't work for them. Now, luckily, I still have them. I've held on to them. Now they're, like, something. You know, people come over like, wow. And I'm like, yeah. You know, they're, these are cool. You know? Yeah, I mean, now they're, like, really cool. I got, like, a big picture of Muhammad Ali that I need to hang up and put it above him. You know, I've, I've got, like, this whole setup. I just haven't bothered to do it, you know? But anyway, I didn't have to work for them. So they weren't that special. But I have other things in my house that I had to work up and save for that I had to really work towards. They're not nearly as valuable as those Muhammad Ali boxing gloves are now. But when I think about how much I treasure and value them, they're things that... I hold on to dear because I had to work for them. I had to spend time and energy and labor getting towards them. And so they matter to me more. They matter because I work towards them. Your salvation, if you're serious about it, will become the most valuable thing that you ever have. Because it's going to be the thing that you have to work the hardest for. Because Jesus says that anybody that wants to come after him will have to take up their cross and follow me. It's going to be hard going to be difficult. It's going to require sacrifice, persecution. It's going to require a willingness to be mocked and scorned. But in the end, it will yield a fruit that is far greater than anything else that you could possibly imagine. 
In the end, it can yield a cure for the problems that you're experiencing. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he said, For if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. And it's interesting in Greek that there's two words for like a creation. One of them refers to like a renovation. Like, you know, we did a major overhaul of the house. We upgraded everything. We did a full renovation. The other one refers to building something brand new from the ground up, totally new. When Paul is speaking here, the Greek word that he is using replies, implies totally new. A brand new from the ground up construction. Jesus didn't come to you to do an overhaul. He didn't come to fix up an old beater and say, you know what, we can patch you, we can paint you, we'll put some Bondo here, we'll get a new set of tires, we're going to get you humming along, we can even do the brakes. That's not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about, what Paul is writing about, is making you brand new. Starting over with something totally new. That's the type of creation that Jesus is talking about. But when you decide to be that new creation, it's a little seed. It's a little spark inside of you. It is brand new. But just like if you've ever, how many of you have ever had like a, a plant that you've been responsible for caring for? Or a garden, or an animal, a dog, a cat, something. Something you've had to keep alive put it like that how many of you have ever been responsible for keeping something alive as small as a plant as large as a dog all right everybody in here is at least at some point had to keep something alive right besides yourself you know you know i've never been good at keeping plants alive you know i don't but you know i've never really tried to have one either but, you know, my dogs, I'm doing a good job. I'm doing a good job of keeping them alive. But it's work. Get up in the morning, you got to make sure there's food in there. You got to check that water. You got to let them out. You got to play with them. You got to love them. You got to care for them. You got to nurture them. You got to do all that. It's work. Got to take them to the vet. Got to get their shots. Got to give them flea and tick medicine. They're an expense. I thought I'd buy them and that'd be it. No, oh no. No, that was just the beginning. Gotta get them groomed. Two toys. Toys, yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is either, but they only like one brand. You wouldn't think they'd know, but they do. And they like the expensive toys. I try the cheap toys, they play with them for a minute, they put them down, they move along. They go back to those expensive ones. There's one brand. I don't know what they spray on those toys over in China, but they go for them. I don't know why. I don't know how. They don't look special, but they know. They know the right toys and they know the wrong toys. They require care, love. Every day, I've got to take care of them. I have to nurture them. If you are to be in Christ, you have to nurture that new creation that's inside of you. You have to feed it. You have to nurture it. You have to decide that that is who you are going to be. Otherwise, you're going to be the most miserable, conflicted, defeated Christian that exists. Because there's nothing more miserable than a Christian that's not living for Jesus. Because all of a sudden you're not enjoying what the world has to offer anymore. You know it's wrong. But you're not living victoriously and so there's no power in your life. You're not seeing any fruit in your life, any victory in your life. You're just stuck in neutral. Not moving in any other direction. But the power that comes when you do start living for Christ is unbelievable. Proverbs 3 talks a lot about the benefits of wisdom. Really, the benefits of living a godly life, of submitting yourself to Jesus, as it were, of saying that I am going to submit to the Lordship of God. 
that I'm going to follow what Jesus said when he said, what's the most important commandment? And it said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, with all of your strength. What does that really look like? Proverbs 3 talks about it. It says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. It's a lesson by itself. Let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Wear them. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. It's interesting that he says, and do not lean on your own understanding, because so often when we are encountering a problem, when we encounter an issue, what's the first thing we think about is what do we think we should do? But yet God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So Solomon here, the wisest man that's ever lived, is telling his kid, do not lean on your own understanding, because your understanding is wrong. If your understanding was right, you wouldn't be sitting here. You wouldn't be struggling with your addictions. You wouldn't be in the position you are in. If you had understanding that was correct, then you wouldn't be here. Nobody would be in the positions that they're in. Everybody that's in trouble all around the world, it's their leaning on their own understanding, their refusal to submit to God. Because your understanding is not correct. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Surrender to God. Listen for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit when you read his word. So many times I will read the word of the Lord and he will tell me what to do. And it seems like the opposite of what I should do. What I would want to do. But yet in the end, that is the correct choice. And every time I actually listen to it and obey it, I'm amazed at the fruit that it yields. It's like, I can't believe that worked. Surprise, really. Shocked. But yet, it does. And not only that, it worked out far better than I could ever imagine. Because I'm so blind spiritually that if I'm lucky, I can see one move in front of me. But God can see the next 10,000, the next 10 million, the next billion events in your life. A sequence that you can't possibly fathom. And so when he lays his wisdom on your heart, he knows what is best for you. He sees it. He goes on, do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing for your body and refreshment for your bones. In verse 13, he goes on, he says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For the profit of wisdom is better than the profit of silver, and its gain is better than fine gold. Wisdom is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. It's easy to look at the eye candy that the devil presents and think, wow, that looks really good. But in truth, there is nothing that the world can present to you that is even close to the value of a relationship with Jesus Christ. For its gain is better than gold, better than fine jewels. It's a simple choice, but it's also the hardest choice. The choice about what you will do with the one whose name is Jesus. <clears throat> Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, with our heads bowed, I would pray that if there is somebody here who has not decided to genuinely follow you, that has not decided to actually surrender to you, that tonight, Lord, with our heads bowed, this would be the moment where they decide to make that simplest and yet most important of decisions. The decision to follow you. Lord, I would pray with our heads bowed that they would just say in their heart, Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. 
I know I've broken your laws. I have done wrong. Lord, I don't even know how many things wrong I've done, but I'm just asking that you would forgive me for everything that I've ever done. Lord, I'm ready to accept your wisdom. I'm ready to accept your lordship over my life. So right now, I'm surrendering to you, dear Jesus. Oh Lord, I'm asking you to send me your Holy Spirit to give me the deposit of your salvation, Lord. Lord, I don't even know where to start, but I know that you can show me. I'm ready to follow you wherever you would lead. Oh Lord, forgive me and allow me to obey you all the days of my life. I'm surrendering to you and acknowledging you as my Savior. Oh God, I would pray for those of us that have acknowledged you, but maybe we're not obeying you, that we would surrender ourselves to you tonight. (coughs) That we would desire you more than we have. That we would be ready to listen and obey. Oh Lord, I pray that each and every man in here would grow in the grace and knowledge of you, Lord Jesus that we would repent before you, that we would study your word, that we would pray diligently, Lord, that we would grow in your grace and knowledge, Lord. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, I pray that grace, wisdom, love, and truth would be multiplied to these men, that you would lift them up and that you would anoint them with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would make your face shine upon them, that you would give them your peace, that you would Place a hedge of protection around the warrior center, Lord, and allow no evil thing to cross the path. But, Lord, pour your Holy Spirit out upon this building. O Lord, it's in the matchless name of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.